We're going to try and get started so that Dr. Mifflin can participate a little bit in the discussion this morning. Our speaker is going to be Adam Guess, one of our cornea fellows, and he's going to speak about fungal keratitis. Thanks. All right. Uh, so can you guys hear me okay? Is this the uh, right volume? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I think I know most of you. I, I'm Adam Guess. I'm one of the cornea fellows this year, and um, I'll be presenting a case that I took care of along with Dr. Mifflin. Um, and this was an interesting case. I, I certainly learned a lot from it, so I thought it'd be interesting to you guys. Um, so this is the, you know, so going all the way back, this patient has a fairly extensive history, but this was the first time we saw her. She's a 54-year-old woman who we first saw in, in uh, 2010. And she has a long history of, of uh, herpetic infections on the left side of her face, dating back to first uh, 18 months of age. And uh, she ultimately developed this interstitial keratitis uh, in her left eye. And uh, when we first saw her, she was presenting for decreased vision in that eye, also some ocular discomfort. Um, you know, and on examination, we see corneal vascularization, scarring, some lipid keratopathy, and a fairly pronounced um, iron line. Um, this lesion was, so first of all, the patient was put on Resectivir to help try to control any of her herpetic flares. But then uh, this lesion was treated in the operating room with uh, cauterization of the, of the feeder vessels to try to get these vessels to, to close down and perhaps limit her, her lipid keratopathy. Um, that didn't really help her vision very much. And the next thing that was done was to give her a subtime uh, injection of Kenalog, again, trying to get the vessels to close up. Um, this, again, was not uh, successful. Uh, she was also treated with subcompensable avastin, again, in the same area to try to uh, close up these vessels. But um, ultimately, the patient's vision did not improve very much. And uh, over the course of the next year or so, she ultimately decided to undergo penetrating keratoplasty in this eye. Uh, so the graft was done. Uh, Surgery proceeded uneventfully. It was an eight millimeter graft uh, with sutures in place with 16 interrupted sutures. And um, you know, as expected, the path analysis showed some stromal vascularization and some chronic actinic keratopathy. Um, the post-op course in this patient was uh, difficult due to poor epithelialization. It, it um, showed a, uh, the neurotrophic nature as a herpetic keratitis patient played a role for sure. Uh, particularly, there was this inferal temporal portion of her graft trouble epithelializing after her, her surgery. Um, this required the use of bandaged contact lenses and ultimately a tarsorophy to try to get the epi defect to, to close and, and epithelialize. Um, by post-op month three after this first graft, her epithelium was healed. Um, she did have some residual stromal thinning, and, and especially in that inferotemporal region of her graft. Um, and then off and on, continued to have sort of sick epithelium. Uh, this required off and on bandage contact lens use. Uh, Vigamox, when she did have um, epi defects, she was maintained on preservative free dexamethasone to try to prevent graft projection. And she was maintained on Valdex to try to um, you know, keep down any herpetic flares. Uh, by post-op month 10, she was doing pretty good. Best corrected vision was 2050. Sutures were removed. And then uh, coming forward uh, to October of this last year, of 2012, um, she presented with a red, painful eye and uh, had a new large epithelial defect sort of centered around the graft edge near this inferotemporal region. Um, the cornea was markedly thin in that region, and the, the tissue was generally kind of soupy, and basically it was a, a graft melt that she was experiencing. Uh, the graft melt was presumed to be herpetic in nature based on her history of, of uh, herpetic infections in that eye. Uh, she was bumped up to her full treatment dose of acyclovir. She was given uh, topical Zergan, Vigamox for the epi defect, and maintained on her dexamethasone. Um, during the uh, couple week course of trying to treat this graft melt, she did develop lesions on her left scalp, which you know sort of confirmed the thought that this was a herpetic infection, that this was zoster causing this melt. Um, unfortunately, the graft continued to thin <laughs> And uh, at one point, it was so thin, we, we were concerned that uh, perforation was uh, uh, going to happen. So at that point, a cyanoacrylate glue was applied with a bandage contact lens over the glue. Um, this bought her about a week, but unfortunately, about f uh, five days later, the glue did come off and the eye perforated. Uh, so this resulted in the patient needing to undergo emergent um, penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, and uh, an 8.75 millimeter, so a larger graft was placed. Um, and tarsorophy was done at the end of the procedure to try to help prevent some of these epithelialization problems that she had had with her first graft. 
Uh, following the second PKP, she actually did pretty well in terms of her epithelium. Uh, pathologic analysis uh, su somewhat surprisingly showed fungal elements in the excised uh, PKP graft. Um, cultures were done, including fungal cultures, at the time of her surgery and didn't show any growth. Um, and the question, you know, at that time we had thought, and still do, I think, think that this was a herpetic melt in nature. So the question is whether this fungus was sort of a cohabitant or whether it was at all, you know, contributing to her uh, melting graft in that region. Um, and, you know, again, based on her history and based on those skin lesions, we thought this was a herpetic uh, infection leading to the graft melt. Um, the patient following her surgery was actually doing pretty well. She was uh, treated with Durazol, Vigamox, she was on acyclovir, sort of a maintenance dose, and then at first using a bandage contact lens to um, help keep the epithelium in good shape. Um, by post-op month three, she was doing pretty well. Her epithelium was intact, the graft was clear. Uh, she was not using the contact lens at that point, was still just on Durazol and acyclovir. So uh, things looking pretty good at that point. Um, unfortunately, about a month later, so this is now uh, February, um, on a Saturday, she calls in because her eye is red, and she noticed um, a concerning white uh, spot on her graft. Uh, she's a pretty savvy patient, so um, she knew that that could be a problem. So um, I, I saw her over that weekend. And um, I, I don't have an image from that day. This is an OR image from a couple days later, so it's not the greatest image. But there basically, there was kind of whiteness um, right along the graft edge, sort of a white uh, infiltrate in that whole region. And again, that's the region where she had had all of her problems with epithelial healing over the course of her graft. Um, in addition to the infiltrate, she had a really intense AC reaction, at least three plus cells. When I first saw her, there was no hypopion, although a couple days later she did have a hypopion. But, um, you know, probably most concerning, she had what appeared to be a fungal ball or hypo ball sort of floating in the anterior chamber. It's hard to see, but it's basically in this region here, and it was sort of this thick circumscribed uh, ball that was sort of adherent to the iris uh, up in that region. Um, so that appearance, you know, and the fact that there were fungal elements in the excised graft, of course, raised, you know, concern for a fungal um, keratitis in this patient. Um, on that day, then, uh, you know, I performed a corneal scraping and culture um, of this infiltrate uh, and started the patient initially on uh, voriconazole fortified drops every hour, uh, oral fluconazole. And uh, I also decreased the Durazol from uh, four times a day down to just once a day um, in case that was playing a role. Uh, also just increased the acyclovir up to her full treatment dose in case herpes was playing a, a component of this. And this was just uh, before and after I did this uh, scraping. Uh, so a couple days later, uh, there was still no growth on culture. I guess that you know, wouldn't be surprising if this were a fungus. Uh, but there was a lot of increased anterior chamber cell and fibrin. Uh, perhaps due to the fungus proliferating, perhaps due to, you know, decreasing the Durazol. Um, perhaps less corneal infiltrate at that time. Um, the natamycin was added, uh, so natamycin was added to her topical voriconazole that she was already using. And then her oral <laughs> agent was switched from fluconazole to voriconazole. Uh, a B scan done at that time, that was a Monday, it was, um, was it showed no posterior involvement. Uh, at that time, we felt like we really needed to get a, uh, an isolate, get a, you know, know what was going on here. So uh, repeat corneal scraping was done uh, with repeat culture. <coughs> and this was actually done in the operating room to try to get uh, a really high yield of anterior chamber fluid. Uh, we wanted to see if we could get any fungal elements to grow out of the anterior chamber fluid, see if we were able to get that fungal ball out, which I, I really wasn't. Um, and also to do a lot of uh, PCR testing on the anterior chamber fluid just to see if there was any herpes uh, viruses in the PCR uh, in the anterior chamber fluid. Um, so then a couple days later, we did get a result, and it was in fact a fungus, um, a fungus called eulocladium, which was certainly a new one uh, to my experience. Has anyone here had experience with eulocladium before? Okay, <laughs> this, this was a new one to me. And, and I'll go over, it's actually quite a rare uh, cause of, of, of fungal keratitis, but I'll, I'll go over in more detail about it. But it's interesting, both uh, cultures grew the same organism. So the one that was done on that first Saturday and the one done a couple of days later, uh, both grew eulocladium. Uh, the anterior chamber PCR was, um, was negative for the herpes viruses. And then all the gram stain and bacterial plates from those two different days did not grow any bacterial, uh, did not show any bacteria. And, and these are just some images from the, that first excised corneal button showing some of the fungal elements that were identified. Uh, this is the susceptibility testing for that organism. Uh, you see here <laughs> that they, they say there are no guidelines for susceptibility testing for this organism. It's a pretty rare um, uh, cause of infection. Um, we yeah. had at this time the patient on voriconazole, which is shown here. 
Uh, natamycin, which is a polyene, so I guess it'd maybe be similar to anthracarosin B susceptibility. Um, but you know, during the course of the patient's treatment, she was treated with natamycin, boriconazole, at one point anthracarosin B, was treated with oral fluconazole and oral boriconazole. So she's been treated with a lot of different antifungals. Um, about uh, three days later, the patient was looking like this. Uh, basically, the, the corneal infiltrate actually looked a little bit better, but the anterior chamber looked really bad. There was a lot of thick uh, fibrinoid material in the anterior chamber, these sort of white fungal balls. This was that one that we first noticed, and then there was a lot of stuff along this area, too. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, suggested at this point that the patient undergo an anterior chamber washout to try to get some of this stuff out of the anterior chamber, uh, followed by injection of anthracarosin B and boriconazole. And it's an interesting surgery. I have just a, a quick sort of edited clip of this surgery. Dr. Mifflin uh, performed the surgery. I wasn't present for this, but it was interesting for me to watch the surgery afterwards because um, just kind of the thick, tenacious nature of this fungal stuff in the anterior chamber. I don't have a lot of um, experience with these kind of fungus in the anterior chamber, but um, I was really surprised by how uh, uh, tenacious this stuff was, which I guess explains why it was hard to get that fungal ball out of the anterior chamber just by doing the AC cath that first uh, that time. Um, so this is using the bimanual uh, vitrector. And you can get a sense that this stuff is pretty thick and adherent. Uh, this patient is phacic, uh, by the way. So there's just some of the stuff coming out. I got just one more uh, little clip of this stuff coming out. I was just <coughs> really surprised at how thick this was. But <laughs> so, so anyway, th um, and you know, after after that, the couple sutures were placed, and the patient did, as I mentioned, receive that AC injection of the antifungal agents or, or uh, antifungal agents. I mean. Um, so, you know, kind of coming forward to now, and I'm glad Dr. Mifflin's here to kind of comment because I haven't seen the patient uh, recently, but, you know, uh, uh, per the most recent note, visions, hand motions, um, there's not really much infiltrate, I'm, I'm, I'm told, in that she still has an epi defect, but it is uh, healing. Uh, the anterior chamber looks a lot better, and uh, I think she did have a tarsorophy, but um, now, is the tarsorophy now taken down? No, it's just maintained. Okay. Um, and she's being maintained on now just boriconazole four times a day, oral fluconazole, uh, the durazole, vigamox, and uh, a full dose of cyclovir. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this specific fungus, but <coughs> Dr. Mifflin, do you have any comments on this patient or on, on her care so far? <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about this organism because this was a, certainly a new one to my experience and kind of interesting the more I looked into it. So um, Eulocladium is a filamentous fungus and it tends to be really widely distributed, uh, more specifically in the soil and in any kind of decaying or herbaceous plants or agricultural materials. We, it's also been isolated from papers, textiles, wood. And you know, and the interesting thing, so traditionally this organism is considered to rarely cause human disease. It's often considered 
preeminent when it does grow uh, on various cultures. But um, that view is changing a little bit on this specific organism, and I have some papers to support that. Um, in, in this case, we don't think it's a contaminant. The same organism grew on both cultures, and this was presenting like the fungal protitis, and there was no bacterial growth on any of these cultures. So we, we do think that this actually did cause her her keratitis, and I do have a couple other papers that mention uh, this specific organism causing keratitis. In fact, it's one of the few types of infections that this organism has been reported to cause in immunocompetent patients. Um, one interesting thing about this specific fungus is that because of its non-pathogenic uh, status, it's often used to control plant diseases for people such as general agricultural products. Um, it's been widely identified in many countries as a result and in fairly high concentrations. So this is an organism that you can pick up uh, or I guess isolate just about everywhere. It's been, um, this was a paper from the Annals of Agricultural um, and Environmental Medicine. And they had a, you know, pages of tables showing various places that this organism has been discovered in various countries. But I just wanted to point out some of the places in the USA where, where they've um, identified this organism. So you see here paint chips in living rooms, carpets, bedspreads and furnitures, floors and homes. So this is a pretty widely distributed um, fungus. You know, it's interesting, I guess the fungus thought to sort of induce plant defenses, and that's the reason that they use it to help try to control plant diseases. It also is a competitive uh, inhibitor. It kind of eats some of the same stuff that certain plant diseases eat, so that's why they, they like to put it on agricultural products. Um, so traditionally, as I said, it's considered to not have uh, pathogenic potential, although, you know, for a while it's been identified in immunocompromised patients causing skin infections, but then more recently there have been increasing reports suggesting that it can cause uh, infections <coughs> in immunocompetent patients. It's, you know, it causes nail infections. Uh, this is a report of a sinusitis that was caused by Eulocladium. And then as I mentioned, there mm -hmm. is a report here of a keratitis uh, happening in an immunocompetent patient. I'll go over that in, in, in some more detail. Uh, so that report is from uh, Badenoch et al., uh, 2005. And this was um, a case of an Australian truck driver, a 43-year-old uh, truck driver who um, really had ophthalmic history and really didn't have any of the risk factors for a fungal keratitis. He had no, no trauma, no contact lens use, no steroid use. Um, developed a keratitis. It was initially treated with foreign clinical. He didn't get much better. Uh, uh, was transferred to a different center where they uh, cultured him and ultimately it grew eulocladium. Um, the patient was then treated with, uh, let's see, hourly fluconazole and natamycin drops. And he did have improvement. Um, ultimately, uh, it was a slow improvement. I mean, it took 24 days for even this, this small uh, ulcer to heal, but ultimately it did heal, and he just had a scar left behind and had best corrected vision of 2020. So uh, this patient did pretty well. Um, they did gene sequencing of the organism that grew, and it's interesting. You notice five different species here uh, that are considered 100% or 99.8% sequence similarity. Uh, there's a lot of nomenclature problems with this specific organism, and a lot of people think that the, a lot of the different species that are listed are actually just maybe one a species. So that's why I think when the microbiologists plated this out, they just called it Eulocladium species rather than identifying it. But um, this was a microbiology journal, and they thought that uh, the appearance under the microscope was most consistent with Eulocladium atrium, uh, for what it's worth. And, and here's a picture from their paper. This is their organism that they isolated on scraping from their patient. Uh, this is our patient. This is from the excised uh, graft. So you see some similarities there. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this, their patient didn't really have any risk factors for fungal keratitis. Um, he did have a history of tinea pedis and was applying fluconazole ointment to his feet, so who knows if that killed him or will at all. But otherwise not your typical fungal keratitis patient. Um, I did find one other case. I found this looking through my Carinet, uh, the corneal email list, and this was um, this was a paper um, published by Marianne and Frank Price and others, um, looking at uh, uh, using uh, collagen cross-linking to treat various different types of infectious keratitis. Um, and they had, you know, they had various uh, pages of tables of different organisms that had been treated, and one of the organisms was Eulocladium. This was a 18-year-old female. Um, with a pretty small ulcer. You see that the max diameter was just 1.5 millimeters, uh, and the patient recovered quickly after the cross-linking treatment. Um, I did actually email Marianne Price to ask her if they have any more information about this patient or any more information about this organism, and she said, you know, not really. Uh, they, you know, this patient got better quickly, and it's not a commonly uh, encountered organism. But 
Uh, we have a couple papers suggesting that this organism does cause keratitis, and this uh, case, I guess, would be the third reported case, uh, as far as I can tell, of a eulocladian uh, keratitis. Uh, one of the questions I had going through my mind as I was researching this stuff is, are fungal infections increasing? Um, you know, in the news a lot lately has been all this stuff from the New England um, Compounding Center. And it's interesting that in their uh, case, this organism was another one of these rare human pathogens, you know, that uh, there was only 33 cases reported in the literature prior to this big outbreak. So this was another case where one of these sort of non-pathogenic or rarely pathogenic organisms was causing a lot of uh, human disease. Um, fungal keratitis in general, the incidence varies widely based on where you are. This was a report from the Proctor Foundation, and just, it just summarized various different other reports talking about the incidence of fungal keratitis. It could be as high as one-third in Miami, whereas in California it's probably less than 10%. Um, you know, a, a study from Madurai, India at Aravind showed that pretty much 50% of their cases of keratitis are fungal in nature there. So uh, geography plays a big role. Um, I stumbled upon this paper from Nature when I was researching, and it was interesting. They were um, sort of tabulating all of what they call EIDs, emerging infectious diseases, so what are, you know, new plant and animal diseases that are appearing. And it's interesting that <laughs> in their tabulated uh, graph here, you know, uh, uh, the huge portion of it, this red part, is, is, is fungal. And in fact, they break down into 20-year periods here, and you see that the incidence of fungal, of new fungal infections is increasing dramatically. Um, who knows if we're just getting better at discovering them or if maybe the antibiotics that we're using everywhere are, are somehow increasing the incidence of fungal infection. And, and this is just the various places where these new fungal infections are um, appearing. You know, and along these same lines, there was this paper from L.V. Prasad, I Institute in India, talking about microsporidia, which is again one of these sort of opportunistic, uh, or what's classically thought to be an opportunistic fungus. Um, and in their uh, study, they found that basically one out of five patients who presents with an infectious keratitis was microsporidia. So uh, again, suggesting that perhaps some of these organisms might be more common uh, causes of keratitis than is traditionally thought. Um, I wanted to, you know, back out a little bit and talk a little bit about just risk factors for fungal keratitis so we can, you know, have our clinical suspicions appropriately raised. You know, and, and this patient basically had almost all of these risk factors. That's, you know, the reason to have a high suspicion for fungal keratitis in this patient. You know, she, we had bandaged soft contact lenses coming on and off the eye. She did have a history of penetrating keratoplasty. And, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of this would be steroid use, which she was on. Uh, she did have ocular surface problems. She had chronic epithelial defects that would kind of heal and then, you know, reappear again. Uh, the patient didn't really have any trauma per se, but these are basically the risk factors for what can, you know, predispose to a uh, fungal keratitis. Um, in case you, I'm sure you're all aware, but this renew um, epidemic was the uh, moisture lock solution that was contaminated with fusarium in, in 2006. Um, so, you know, the medical management of fungal keratitis is challenging. We really don't have an ideal drug to use. Um, the ones that we do use tend to be poorly soluble um, and tend to be low potency, so we need to really increase the concentrations to make them work. And there's a pretty high variability between in vitro and in vivo sensitivity. And the other problem is that these fungi, uh, fungi can um, become resistant. Um, furthermore, when you increase the concentrations up enough to have an effect, it can often become toxic to the cornea. You know, and in fact, when I was researching the fortified boriconazole to tell the you know, pharmacist how to, how to make it, I noticed that over the various papers with time, the concentration of what's being used has increased like 20-fold from when it was first used. So we're using fairly high concentrations of these antifungals. Um, but, you know, the main ones we use typically would be amphotericin B, natamycin, and voriconazole. You know, and, and the types that are used is going to vary by center. Uh, there was one study from Mass Eye and Ear suggesting that amphotericin was their most used uh, agent. But it, it's going to vary. You know, I think natamycin is probably the most widely used just because it's commercially available. And, you know, 70% of people who treat uh, fungal keratitis will give the patient an oral agent as well, and these are the oral agents that are, you know, tend to be used. Um, there aren't a lot of uh, studies comparing the antifungal agents, and in fact, there was a recent Cochrane database review suggesting that there weren't enough randomized control trials to make a big difference. Well, this is one randomized control trial uh, looking at natamycin and boriconazole. This was done at uh, Aravind Eye Hospital in, in India. <laughs> And uh, it was 120 patients. You know, they have a pretty high incidence of fungal keratitis there. Uh, most organisms in their series were, were uh, Fusarium and Aspergillus. Um, and basically, they found no statistical difference between natamycin and voriconazole. 
Um, it's interesting, they didn't note a non-significant trend, and by that I mean the p-value was 0 0.07, so almost significant towards better final vision with the voriconazole compared to the anatomycin. And then the other issue they looked at, a lot of people had uh, questioned whether repeat scraping of fungal ulcers uh, results in better uh, healing, and there was a non-significant trend, meaning a p-value of 0 0.08, uh, suggesting that the ultimate vision was worse with repeat scraping. Um, I did also want to mention one paper talking about surgical treatments for fungal keratitis. Um, you know, it's unclear if this patient will ultimately need a, s a surgical treatment for it, but uh, this was a study from Singapore talking about doing penetrating keratoplasty for, uh, you know, they really included all infectious keratitis. So in their series, you know, for example, 58% was pseudomonas, but 32% was fusarium. So they did have a fairly high incidence of fungal infection. Um, you know, and basically in their series, people who had ulcers affecting the whole cornea, ulcers encroaching on the limbus were treated surgically. Um, and you know, it's interesting, in their series also, uh, so first of all, they did large graphs because they tried to get around all of the infected material. And a lot of times they did what's called uh, scleral keratoplasty where, you know, they basically save one quadrant of limbal stem cells and then on the other quadrants they go all the way to the limbus. Um, it's interesting that in their cases of fungal keratitis, they didn't use any steroids for the first several weeks, the first one to three weeks, and they did use antifungal agents during the first one to three weeks after surgery. And so that's something that was not done in this case. So we could have potentially uh, given the patient antifungal treatment as she was recovering, but from her uh, uh, keratoplasty. Um, these are just their results. Uh, you know, it's kind of a kind of a long. Uh, survival curve, but you know, in essence, the one-year survival rate for these fungal uh, cases was 72 percent. That means graft survival, which is pretty good considering that a lot of these cases were perforated or you know, impending perforated. And um, you know, they did mention in their article too that while the bacterial recurrences tend to happen within days of the graft, fungal recurrences often took weeks or months to show up. And when they did show up, they tended to be kind of an indolent, sort of an endophthalmitis type pictures, which is, you know, not un unlike the way our patient was presenting. So, you know, in summary, I wanted to present this case because it's, you know, a rare cause of infectious keratitis. As far as we know, this is only the third case of Eulocladium that's been reported. Um, you know, and fungal keratitis itself is rare, but, you know, there is some suggestion that perhaps, you know, fungal infections are increasing. Um, I just wanted to also review these, you know, risk factors just so all of us can have them in the front of our mind, you know, prior penetrating keratoplasty, any kind of non-healing or chronic epi defect, topical steroid use or soft contact lens use, which all, this patient had all of these, you know, and just I wanted to reiterate the importance of, you know, suspecting fungus and not being afraid to culture uh, in these cases. Um, thanks. Any, any, any questions or comments? Sabrodextrose, uh, the, the way to the, the way to culture the fungus. Mm -hmm. uh, are you limiting your testing on how you measure the risk cases that there are options where they can localize as to fungal endothelitis coming from contamination somewhere, either in solution or a medication or something that's used? And um, Randy Olson was involved when he was at UCLA, I mean, this was about 30 years ago. And I heard else first came out, they were using a system where they were using a hydrogen. Basically, they were using um, a material to keep things from spoiling, and then the problem is it, it was a real basement material that mm -hmm. they then had a residue left in the lens, and you had to dip it into a neutralizing solution to get it in the eye, and mm -hmm. somebody that made the neutralizing solution had a fungus problem that they were pursuing, and I just mm -hmm. see this as a horrible case of infectious virus mm -hmm. from this fungal contamination. Data out by HCL fungal corneal ulcers has been related And I, maybe Dr. Moshevar could comment on this. When I was in California, it was what well, would be around around here. Yeah, I had a 
one thing that can't come true is the pictures of like us in Vegas and Yeah. Stuff like that. We just can't get out of that. I think it's something that just never gets done and it's kinda like the it's like our only thing going is the Our Canada, I guess would be another one. Yeah, well yeah, east east west is east. kinda just yeah. We see it's like you say, our Boston trip is kinda through East Coast now. Yeah. And that's when these kinda hybrids still get 'em captured and stuff and um but um seeing um Cubello play kinda be the hybrid that kinda develops these kinda hybrids. And it's because we have them on Google Maps and bank them on Team Four Never. But yeah. since we have a plant called Saint John, even though they're not on tropical fruit it's a syrup and it's just for natural protection, we don't need that for our Boston trip with our peaches. But I see once in a while kids do take them to Cubello and they hand me that hybrid down and go, Ah, it's time to do something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or um we have beer house friends that like the farm that ends up selling all the time to take them there. So uh, in Boston trips across species, when I see a patient who comes in just to answer you, it's most of the time Canada. So that one I can say Canada, but the others I think all Canada. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Alright, well, thanks. Oh, are you? Okay, well, I, I mean, I, I could let me know. Thank you.